Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the forum, the official podcast series of the Diplomacy Law and Policy Forum. We're joined today by Ms. Aisha Malik, who is the editor of the Diplomacy Law and Policy Forum, and today we'll be discussing autonomous weapons. Thank you for joining us, Aisha. Thank you. So Aisha, you know, drones have been used for the past decade or so, and you know everyone keeps talking about them. So, what's all this fuss about autonomous weapons? Aren't they just another form of drones? Yeah, so autonomous weapon systems are actually incredibly fascinating. Uh the kind of technology that we're seeing now especially um it's really interesting to see it in the context of rapid technological advancement. So early warfare you saw, you know, probably started with the first guy who threw the first rock at somebody else in anger. And then now we have these autonomous weapon systems which are very much like a like a sci-fi dystopian nightmare i robot type thing um and what do we actually mean by them how are they different from drones um autonomous weapon systems are essentially weapons which are activated by humans and then once they're activated they can select and engage targets without any further human intervention right so you humans are installing them they're activating them and then they just go off and they perform their functions entirely autonomously and there's no ability for a human to be in the loop so we have a distinction between humans in the loop which means that humans are actually you know fully in control of these weapons and then a human on the loop which means that there's human supervision and so if they're fully autonomous weapon systems and we call them lethal autonomous weapon system laws or killer robots it's a colloquial term for them it means that there is no human in the loop or on the loop you activate them and then they go off um and your question is cu- quite correct to talk about them in the context of what's the fuss all about how is this new and i i kind of had this idea before i went into the research which was that these are completely new and you know their technological advancement beyond our time and now their current issue which is affecting IHL which is affecting the laws of war um but actually we've had fully autonomous lethal weapon systems before when we look at mines so mines once activated um they engage in select their targets all on their own which means anyone who is really crossing over which means that you can have a mind go off and attack the person who installed it or you know anyone from any side really and i think this is why there was a lot of outcry with the use of mines because children exactly. would, would you know run across them yeah non non combatants would run across them so i think yeah, that's that's yeah. the issue then okay yeah and and a huge issue with mines being left all over the place that we're seeing in afghanistan in in many other conflict areas and so you had countries come together i think 162 countries come together being like we're going to ban the use of anti personnel mines mm-hmm. similarly you also have loitering munitions which are also fully autonomous in the sense that you will let a loitering munition go in an in a wide area and it will go in that area and select um targets itself and engage the targets itself um so we've had fully autonomous weapon systems before the kind of use we're seeing now is very different um so in 2020 you had the use of a fully autonomous weapon drone called the Slaughterbot which was used by the Lib- Libyan government of national accord against the Libyan national army right so we're seeing this being used in a non-international armed conflict no humans are in the loop it targeted it it can use swarms <laughs> these slaughter bots so we're seeing the use of you know them working together to like take out these targets uses facial recognition it has gps targeting which can't, even if it's jammed it, it will still work um that kind of thing so it software is developed in a way to target humans and this was a turkish made um okay. drone and so uh the difference between drones of before that we're seeing used in say Wazirstan or like across the in Afghanistan Yemen um they are remotely piloted right okay. so there is a guy who is kind of using a joystick in Langley Virginia who is operating a kind of so the um, final decision to shoot is coming from a human being exactly. but in this one I'm so what 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 I'm understanding from what you're saying is like the machine is deciding everything the machine is deciding everything okay. and when you have uh, so the main issue with people you know talking about these remotely piloted drones is the fact that you have these people you know as if they're on a computer game and they're making all of these decisions but you're essentially taking that human out now you're taking a human in to be like here's the drone go off the drone goes off and does whatever it wants right. likes the targets itself um So it's really novel they're calling it the third revolution in warfare after gunpowder gunpowder and nuclear arms. Um and it is going to be interesting to see how much this technology advances. So right now the kind of uh, attacks we're seeing in 2020 are pretty incredible that you can have this machine which uses facial recognition 
knows what it wants to target can take out that target. Um, how much further is this going to go? Mm, so, you know, you've mentioned facial recognition twice. And so essentially, um, we are the, what autonomous weapons are doing is they're shifting us to completely algorithmic warfare. And, you know, facial recognition and all these th- things, they work on stuff like artificial intelligence and machine learning. But the problem then becomes that even with artificial intelligence, you know, there was an outcry recently where photo recognition software on, I think this was Twitter's algorithm or somewhere else. I don't, I, I don't remember. But then the issue was they were misidentifying African Americans. Yeah. And a study by the US government showed that five uh, African Americans were misidentified five to 10 times more right, than, you yeah. know, um, normal uh, Caucasians, let's say. Um, so, and even when you have, so you know how these systems develop is ultimately the machines don't learn themselves. We are feeding them information yeah. and then, you know, through a continuous cycle of learning and relearning, they figure figure things out. But then you have things like these issues with facial recognition software, then how can the machine ultimately distinguish whether they're hitting, let's suppose, target X or someone who looks similarly, ridiculously close to target X? Then what, how do you overcome that? Yeah, I- I think there are really two issues that you're alluding to there. The first is the ethics of the whole thing, the whole death by algorithm. Does it undermine human dignity? Does it undermine um, any kind of, you know, your right to life in the sense that you should be, the decision to kill you should not be made by algorithm. It should not be made by an inanimate machine. Your death should be on a human conscience. Um, I think that goes a little bit too into the philosophy of things whenever I hear that argument. I don't want to die in an armed conflict. I don't care if I'm dying by a robot or by a human. I just don't want to, I, I just don't want to be killed if I'm a civilian and I shouldn't be killed at the time. Um, but also the, the question about, um, the biases of humans being fed into these systems is a huge issue. And we're seeing that issue with bail. Um, the facial recognition issue is about like, you know, there is like more African Americans. Uh, and that similarly, but, but seeing that we will see that likely because it is being fed into, as you said, by human computer programming, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so there is an option that would be racially biased. It's going to misidentify also African American. Uh, faces or brown faces and so we are going to be probably see more killings of black and brown people and also uh, there's a gendered lens to this as well so men are going to be more perceived as being in, the, in a combat role than they are to be a civilian even if they're acting as a civilian um, so the the option of misidentifying people as human beings would is also going to be fed into the system and that is something that it is going to have to have to counteract even when um you were having remotely piloted drones attacking people in Pakistan, Afghanistan. They were, they were looking at things, uh, very benign, um, actions such as, you know, going up to a hill and trying to find a signal for your phone. They were looking at that as, uh, something potentially very, very threatening and terrorist activity. Um, so you are going to be seeing those uh, biases fed into the system. What I would find really interesting in a way to like counteract that would be to see that this is a Turkish made drone, uh, which is operating in Libya. So would you, it would the global south or other countries, say China or Turkey, getting these, um, weapons, would that change anything in terms of the gendered biases? Cause they wouldn't, the gendered and the racial biases, because they wouldn't work in the same way as we're seeing in America or the UK. And so, and there's another aspect to this, and I think that takes the conversation slightly into the whole issue of data privacy and all. But, you know, a while back, there was this app, uh, everyone was using it. I think this, they, it manipulated your age to see, show how you yes, would look like a few yes. years from now. And then the conversation became, you're basically, you're training the machine. And then the machine's learning how a brown people would, a brown person would age and how a white person yeah, would age and how an yeah. Asian person would age. But then it, you're giving it all the data. And then we know there've been cases where companies would just sell all your data to, you know, the highest bidder. Facebook was accused of it. Other other uh, tech companies have been accused of that. So I think ultimately that's another conversation that that could be had. But moving on to your um, your point about um, getting back to your point about you know machines making the decision. So I I was wondering, you know, so in the U.S. a lot of things are done differently than they would be done in let's suppose Afghanistan. You know, there a farmer there uses the latest. Um, a tractor a farmer in Afghanistan would probably be using a shovel mm. and then when an autonomous weapon is flying over them how does you know the it distinguish from you know a shovel and an AK-47 because that's not something they've considered feeding into their system yeah and then also um 
the uh, the other issue here becomes you know when you let's suppose you're going to war with someone and then you know the the enemy they realize we are outnumbered there's no point in fighting and they raise a white flag let's suppose a human does that in front of an autonomous weapon the machine doesn't know perhaps mm. what a white flag means is or you know if if it's a person in a white shalwar kameez how does the machine distinguish from yeah. a white shalwar kameez yeah. or a white you know ethnic dress and a white flag so how how do what do you think of these challenges so i think that there are definitely challenges now and even when they've tried to test autonomous weapons uh they've actually found that the um the weapon systems get confused between yellow school buses and think that they're ostriches and there are ways okay. to you know um to get into the system and make it think that there is an object there where, where there isn't anything there um and so these are definitely issues especially when you look at the laws of war and the distinction between a civilian and a combatant and then you have civilians who directly participate in hostilities how do you make those distinctions they're really really difficult for humans to do never mind an inanimate machine and people do argue that you know it has to be based you making that assessment making that judgment at the time it has to be based on you know subtle behavioral cues that you can feed into that that a human would know it can it can sense when on the other side there's like a very fearful civilian yeah. um in a way that a machine can't do and even with uh, you know imagine if somebody is holding just scrap metal or something and not confusing that with it being an ak47 how do we get to that point where the where a machine would know that when uh, otherwise a human might be able to pick up on those cues and be like oh i would not target that person um similarly a, a key issue which is raised is the is the idea that will they be able to tell when someone's surrendering and so no longer is participating in hostilities and so can't be targeted i feel like all of these things can be fed into the system provided there is enough technological advancement and we are going to see that going forward or perhaps enough with further will. tests yes yeah with yeah. enough will as well and also I think I think the issue then would come down to the indeterminacy of international humanitarian law. Um making identifying between a civilian directly participating in hostilities and a civilian who isn't and targeting and not targeting on that basis and also targeting and uh complying with the proportionality principle these are incredibly difficult calculations to be made humans aren't even always capable of making those calculations how do you weigh a human life um a number of human lives against the military advantage sort right um and i think some people then the counter argument to that is well what if this makes us make those laws more determinate and so we had all of these nation states come together in 1977 most of them are enshrined in the additional protocol 1 um and they were as clear as we're going to get right which means that they're still incredibly ambiguous um we still don't really know what proportionality is could this be a way the use of laws could they be a way for us to be like states have to now sit together and make a definite calculation of what proportionality actually means so you can feed it into these systems we need to properly identify what a civilian directly participating in hostility is so we can feed that into the system and the machine is aware um the thing with issues in law like this especially in the fog of war it wouldn't affect a person so you it wouldn't affect a robot in the same way as it would a person how can you feed that in are we going to get to a point where states actually do sit and be like this proportionate this isn't something which is inherently tricky to do um i don't know that's especially that's because be especially when you consider the fact that you know the geneva conventions as the, as useful as they may be they're they're very old yeah you know yeah. so they were uh, written after post post world war 2 yes so yeah. you know how do they deal with advancements in technology and even then we don't get into you know any kind of um uniformity with regards to what definitions and what's the scope of them and all um, yeah and i think uh, sorry just no, no, kind of it's it, it is we are looking at warfare from the geneva conventions which was done at a time when you had states facing each other across the battlefield and now we move from then to someone sitting in Langley Virginia can you know select and take out a target in uh you know the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan and now we're getting to the point where you can be 
activating a swarm of drones and they can go and select and take out targets themselves. That was not envisaged at the time of the Geneva Conventions. Yeah. So maybe it is a time to move past that, to move on and get a new convention which would apply to these weapons. Um, there are about 30 states now which are calling for a preemptive ban on these weapons, Pakistan included, and there are about 97 countries which have expressed concern about them. Um, at the same time, you also have a global AI arms race with China, India, the US, the UK, really heavily, heavily investing in these weapons. Um, and in terms of, oh, are they an inevitability? A few years ago, you would have many people argue like, this science fiction, we're not there yet. Why are we having all of these debates? And then you see this attack in 2020 and you're like, actually, no, uh, those debates weren't premature at all. It And it almost has become an inevitability. I don't think that states are going to look at a weapon system which allows their servicemen to be protected, which is cheaper, which is safer for their armed forces generally, and be like, no, actually, we won't do that. Yeah. Well, you've seen that happen with blinding laser weapons that states have, uh, you know, come together and banned that from even being developed. But we're not there yet with laws. States are already developing it. They're already using it. And especially the fact that you can now buy very cheap drones on Amazon for like $500. Yeah. So you can buy them. They can autonomously travel. They will avoid obstacles and they will go and do whatever you want them to do. And then when they're low on batteries, they will come back home. Yeah, so there's this uh, fascinating technology. I think Pakistan is trying to introduce that in uh, in the field of agriculture. So, you know, whereas you would normally have a person going in and spraying the fields, you, yeah. just, you just feed the root and then the, the robot, the, the, the drone just goes in and sprays the entire field. Right, right. And previously, I think three years back, that used to cost like five, six thousand dollars. And now the cost has come down to a, thousand, exactly. a couple of thousand dollars. And I was actually going to base my next question on that. When you said that the, the, the so many countries are investing heavily into it so with, we see with all kinds of technologies when the investment goes up eventually the cost of the, the technology yeah. comes down and when you tie that into what the the first example you gave about the slaughter board in libya i think one thing that not a lot of people are considering is what if non-state actors get this yeah. and we've already yeah. seen examples of um, entities like isis you know they, they just get drones off amazon and yeah. then, you know, just strap yeah. a bomb on them and then make it fly into a building or whatever yeah, so yeah. how do you how do you see that developing yeah so it, it is really interesting that we're talking about and i think state it might become a bit like uh the nuclear hegemony of states so states that have it will be like nobody else should have um you know ai based lethal autonomous weapon systems uh but you will see that proliferation as the technology becomes cheaper and readily more readily available um isis has been as you said ordering them off amazon strapping them with arms and sending them out and then turkey has been sending out eagles to go and take them down which i find to be very like games of thrones versus like something like irobot um so, yeah, and you're going to see that the proliferation among non-state um, groups is something which is going to be um, expressly uh, difficult. But but at the same time, you will have, it will be impossible to avoid as well because it will give rise to such asymmetric warfare where someone is actually fighting for their lives and then the other person is, the other state is fighting for who cares about a robot's life, right? Especially when it's so much cheaper. Um, so, so it will give rise to a very dystopian type of asymmetry in warfare, the kind of which we haven't seen readily before. And the argument goes that, you know, would it make it more easy to, um, to go to war as a result of having these weapons? Um, but I think that that is something, that is an argument that's been made about any weapon system, you know, like from the start with the machine gun, would that make it more easy? Would nuclear weapons make it more, more easy? We see that everywhere. Um, so yeah, yeah, it is it is going to be a huge issue in keeping it away from these non-state um, groups or even away. And I think the hegemony will be there to try and keep it away from states that they don't want to have uh, these weapons, similarly with nuclear proliferation. Um, and that's going to be something very interesting to see. Also because um, the asymmetry is there, the inequality is there so so profoundly, right? Because we we can see that automation um, does make things more safe. So you have airplanes which are now automated. You're talking about these drones uh, going over agricultures. They make things easier and safer for people to do. Uh, Self-driving cars, for instance, that kind of thing. So if you're taking away that safety from 
another bunch of people uh, and you're doing it on purpose. And at the same time, you're protecting your own servicemen, as we know, you know, the US and UK love to do. And you're depriving another side of that right. It's going to be it's going to be quite interesting to see how that plays out. Mm. I think ultimately it all, all goes back to what you said in the beginning about having a human on the loop. Uh, but that, then again, that also raises some questions, I think. So, for example, even with the drone program, we, we see stories of, you know, targeting civilians and all. But even despite the fact that, you know, someone's signing off on those strikes and there's probably some level of hierarchy that's going on in approving them. And even if there are mistakes, they identify them, they, we never hear about them unless yeah. there's a whistleblower who comes out and says that, you know, hey, this was a mistake uh, that yeah. we made. This shouldn't be happening. So that's one thing that that comes to my mind when I think about accountability for such weapons. and then. So, you know, I wonder whether we should have some sort of an oversight body like the IAEA that, you know, okay, we know that these weapons exist. We know that this technology is developing. These are some of the limitations that we uh, we think should be in place. And this is an oversight body. But then you think of states like the US and perhaps now even China that they wouldn't want you yeah. know, um, yeah. outside entities looking in, especially when, you know, they would be concerned about their military secrets being used yeah, or yeah, someone else exactly. copying it. So how, yeah. how do you think we, we tackle this challenge of accountability and oversight? Yeah, I think I think the whole oversight idea is the most important. I think that when um, other states are coming into, as in if we're going to accept that these weapon systems are an inevitability, I think that the most important thing then to do would be that there should be human on the loop all of the time. Um, that you should have, you know, something that isn't just left out there and then there's no accountability. We don't know about breaches are incredibly vulnerable to coding flaws, all of that kind of thing. And and with that level of digitization, you're never going to get away from the possibility that there can be a breach, that there can be hacks. What happens in that case? Um, and I always go back to... Uh, the the US being very heavily involved in the negotiations for the Rome Statute and putting in, you know, the defense for superior orders does apply to war crimes because they wanted to protect their servicemen. And I think that for many states, this is kind of like a great opt-out clause, right? Because you won't have that level of criminal responsibility. You could have state responsibility on the base that was manufactured and deployed by a certain state, but an individual won't have the criminal intent um, satisfied to have committed a war crime if if say this uh weapon system goes haywire and goes and you know shoots a bunch of civilians there won't be that criminal intent there he'd be like oh, i just deployed the weapon that's it so, you know there's this there's this case going on in, in europe right now where this german woman i think she's in her 90s mm. and she was a secretary at one of the nazi death camps mm. and then they, they've hunted her down and the debate now is that she was just a secretary she yeah, was just yeah. doing secretary work but there i think she's facing trial now right when you yeah. think about that in context of these weapons that you know um the argument could be that you know oh we just press the button and yeah. then it was the machine yeah, making the exactly. which goes back yeah, to what yeah. you said that you know the death of a human being and or a murder of a human being mm. should be on the conscious of a human it should yeah, be on the conscious yeah. of a machine so how i it's it's very even in ter- exactly in terms of criminal re- accountability but but you can see also why states would love that right because they doesn't want its people to be yeah. held accountable for something like this it wants to be like this is the machine's fault and we need to get rid of these coding flaws in the machine and you know we'll make sure that it doesn't happen again but yet at the same time i mean how many people are held criminally, criminally accountable for things like this we have we have yet to see an american in the docket at the hague um but but it does really take that out the the causal aspect it takes out entirely and what does that mean for international criminal law ultimately yeah. and also you know ultimately you know it's it's kind of sad and tragic but you see the way these things play out yeah uh, some lives do seem to matter more than the others so yeah. a, f- a few years back there was a case in pakistan i think afghanistan there was an italian mountain climber and he was killed as part of a drone strike by mistake mm. and the u.s government they said okay it's, it was a mistake and they ended up paying like a very hefty amount, some million dollars. Yeah, but then yeah. you would see civilians in, in Afghanistan in the tribal areas of Pakistan being killed all the time. And they're like, oh, we're sorry, we made a mistake. Yeah, yeah, So exactly. it, like the recent strike in Afghanistan, you know, yeah. they openly accept it, but do, you don't expect them to pay such a hefty yes, amount yeah. in, in damages and reparations yeah. to an Afghani family. Yeah, and opposed- whenever they have, the, the amo- amounts have been so paltry yeah. that it's been, it's just an embarrassment really to, to be given that much. Um yeah, and there is there is also a very interesting counter argument. Uh, I was reading Sisoli's article about this, and I I thought it was very 
it was very interesting in he he doesn't look at this from the perspective of this crosses this moral threshold that we should never cross that is morally repugnant and you know politically unacceptable which is what the UN have said um he looks at it in the way that robots can't be inhumane the way humans can you will never have a human you will never have a robot acting out because of fear fatigue revenge uh and then he ends up with this kind of, with this line which which i think has stayed with me which is that robots do not rape so you won't see them go out of their way to to inflict harm where it's not strictly necessary and and i find that a very very interesting argument i find it very interesting to to say that these will improve compliance with ihl because you won't see these run away uh you know power going to these people's heads or the the situation going to these people's heads that we've seen in the, in you know war crime situations of other servicemen in other conflict areas um and i think that's a very very interesting argument and i wonder whether more states will actually take that up to be like this is actually promoting compliance with IHL you won't see the kind of depravities that we can we almost look at as inevitable with you know mm-hmm. a side effect and salary effect that that's just there unavoidable um with um um conflicts generally where we do see rape we do see revenge killings we do see uh people you know losing it after seeing their friend you know every battlefield movie that you can think of really which is premised on this yeah. um you won't see that with robot and I, i i find that an interesting argument at the same time i think and i think for me it kind of like weighs a little bit better on me than the whole idea that oh no your death should be on a human being's conscience because that already isn't the case you know yeah. you have indiscriminate aerial bombing campaigns you had them in Tokyo you had them in Dresden in the second world war you have a mine who can take anyone out any and loitering munitions are kind of acceptable um and we haven't done anything to ban those weapons we haven't done anything to ban you know someone tr- flying at 15,000 feet unable to see anything below and dropping dropping explosives so why is that so much more heinous than this yeah uh, i i you know i could argue with that like i agree with you over there that you know it's ultimately humans who are doing most of the yeah. very distasteful things but then even when we try to you know build this into the robots it's ultimately humans who are programming the robots yeah. so it creates yeah. a very it's creates a very uneasy kind of circle and then what you said earlier um I think this issue can be resolved if everyone comes together and figures out proper definitions of all the the key IHL terms and how then they can be fed into the machines and that's some yeah, some way yeah. that and, in and which we can how, break the circle. Sorry. Yeah, I agree. And it's weird how we, we hope that there will be a political will, but even now as states are kind of trying to sidestep. So the UK has come out and said we do not believe in autonomous weapons. We do not believe that they should be there. We believe that there should be no autonomous weapons at all. And then you look at it and what is their definition? and they've they've said that autonomous weapons are very different from automated weapons and then when you look at the definition of automated weapons is basically an autonomous weapon okay. system so again what states do Explain and what they the say yes <laughs> yes exactly um another aspect to the whole human on the loop thing um there's this example that's given off in, in uh, during the cold war when i think one russian radar it just sent out a false signal and then the, the system yeah. was programmed in a way that it would detect Uh, a missile launch from the US and then the person who was sitting there he just said oh you know what maybe this is a mistake maybe yeah. this is a mistake yeah. and he didn't end, end up retaliating and what's of he's often called as one of the people who saved the world there's a similar incident like that i think that involved a russian submarine and you know all of these had had he fired back at the US we would probably wouldn't be sitting here you know yeah so yeah. um but that was averted because there was a human there making the final call mm. so do you think regardless of how advanced the weapons may end up becoming a human should be making the final call because you know machines do make mistakes this was by, yeah, exactly. by of, for that era this was the most state of the art technology yes, and it malfunctioned yeah, yeah. and in this era you know there's always a likelihood that the, the technology might malfunction so should there be a human in all the, at all times i think that there should be and i think that that ex- example is a very interesting one because because um when i was reading i was actually reading about that the other day as well and it was very interesting because he was like oh why would the us attack at this time why would they have just sent five missiles and Absolutely. he kind of sat down yeah and he kind of sat down and he was like okay i have a feeling that something's gone wrong here and this is not them attacking we won't fire back um and 
the need to have a human on the loop, I think is incredibly important. I think even when you look at autopiloting, it's made airplanes so much safer. At the same time, you have a human there for when the machine is going. And they can override the system. Yeah, exactly. They can be like, no, this does not add up here. There's, There's something going wrong. And so it's the difference between you being in a plane where there is a pilot, but it's running on autopilot. And you being in a plane where there's no pilot at all. <laughs> like, you know, how it's, would you it, it's feel like, about that? You know the runway trolley problem where if you if it when you have to decide when switching the switch and uh, you know a lot of people make the switch yeah, uh, yeah. And, and choose to kill one person instead of five. But when the when the exa- when the experiment was repeated where you had to actively push someone, yeah. people didn't do that. And you know when I'm thinking when I think of this guy who didn't press the button for the Soviet missiles, it's like you know. As a human being, if I had that power just before pushing that button, I would be thinking like, you know, this would kill X amount of people. Right. And right. robots don't have that consciousness. Yes, humans yes, do have exactly. that. Exactly. So, um, and then it also brings a question, are are all these te- technological developments, you know, are they making war less humane? Than mm. you? Because yes, humans do make mistakes, but then, yeah. you know, you have stories like, I think it was uh, the First World War uh, when there was a ceasefire on Christmas Day and German and uh, British soldiers, they played football yeah, yeah, in between yeah. the trenches. Yeah. So, you know, they they recognize that, okay, we're doing something, but end of the day, the other party is also human, but the machines, they, they, they just cannot recognize that. Yeah, part. yeah, exactly. That's really true. And I feel like there is a push also to make it more inhumane in a way to to up the deterrent value. So I was reading about this robot that South Korea has now um, acquired as kind of an autonomous weapon system. And it uses it to patrol the DMZ uh, and the border with North Korea. And what it what it loves to say about the robot is that it is fully autonomous. So like there's no leeway like you would get with a human where you, know, you can out with the system. There's also no leeway in kind of like pleading for your life or anything like that. The human will, will the robot which is patrolling this border um, will just select a target and take it out. And I think the reason why they have that robot there is for the deterrent value, because then it's like there is no there is no leeway to be human <laughs> in that yeah. sense. There is no leeway to get out of the system. So does that prevent you from even trying uh, with something like that? And I think I I think yeah, warfare has become less humane because you're not facing each other off a battlefield. You're not seeing the, your adversary. You're not acknowledging that that person is a human being. Um, and I think that that's, that's been something that's happened for decades to, to be like, oh no, we, we stopped that from happening from now. I don't think that that will happen. Um, but yeah, maybe you know, we can go back makes, to Game of Thrones time. <laughs> it, makes me, it makes me think of, you know, what you, the example South Korea and North Korean example you just gave. You know, we hear all these stories about people defecting from countries like North yeah. Korea and then, and other stories as well. And almost always there's an element of, you know, we met these border guards, we pleaded for our lives yeah. and they chose to have mercy on us. And they're like, yeah. okay, let's go. But the machines will never do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, another, another thing which I was uh, thinking about is, what if there is a marriage between cyber warfare and autonomous weapon warfare? Yes, you know, so yes. we have had instances of hackers, you know, getting into the Pentagon. Mm. We've had this recent case where the U.S. and Israel they took out a nuclear facility in Iran. Mm. So, um, what's to prevent a hacker from, you know, turning your own robots, even if let's suppose you possess them, and I turn them against you? Yes. So yeah. Hard. So there, there can be a hacker. There can be a breach. It's almost like the iRobot scenario, right? Where they turn on their own people, and you have the option for a fratricide, which means that they will take out friendly forces, like forces on whose side they're on, uh, because they don't understand or they malfunction. And you can have a breach, which will do that. And so the idea is to get them to the point where there can't be those breaches, uh, which depend, depends again on how technologically advanced you are. I feel like in terms of cybersecurity, I feel like that is the area where you're going to have the most use of autonomous weapons. Because in cybersecurity, it's something that when you have a threat, you have to get back at it in milliseconds, right? So, so states will want to deploy um, autonomous weapons in that sense to, to ensure safety. Um, and we're seeing increased use of them because um, human beings simply can't respond that fast to yeah. a cyber threat. Um, and these machines can, they can respond in milliseconds. Mm-hmm. So we're going to see much more use. Of, as we see cyber uh, warfare increasing, we're going to see actually much more, I think, use of autonomous weapons in that. So in ultimately, that I think regard. it's a very glim outlook for the... <gasps> yeah. uh, for the future. Um, so finally, 
I think we've, we've established that, you know, it's only a matter of uh, when, not if, you know, yeah, these, yeah. these weapons will become the norm. Um, do you foresee a new arms race, especially in places like India and Pakistan? Because, you know, uh, what a lot, I, I feel that many people, like even when the, the, the conversations on nuclear deterrence, deterrence were going on, that, you know, they, they, every all the scholarship all the research on issues like this is very western based yeah so you know you would consider okay the u.s fires a weapon and the soviet union has this much time to mm-hmm. take out the weapon and then similarly now between the u.s and china the china fires a weapon and the yeah. u.s has this much time to take the weapon out what they don't consider is like for countries like pakistan when you know india and pakistan you know they share a border flight times are like hardly a few minutes yeah or even now when we saw i think in the karabakh conflict i think between azerbaijan and armenia drones mm-hmm. and these such kind yeah. of weapons were used yeah how do you know and um adding on that so when we talk about proliferation of weapons like nuclear weapons these are very very complex systems they require a lot of resources which are very scarce but then when you think of these systems yeah. all you need is a very talented programmer a very cheap drone yeah. and then you know probably like x kgs of explosives and then you can just pack into it and set, send, set, send it on its yeah. way so with the global proliferation uh, of these weapons what do you think that's going to look like in in the near future or the not so near future and how do you think that's uh, something you know IHL can consider when you know when when all these countries do eventually if they do come together and have a conversation yeah i actually think um i actually think that the the 30 countries which have said that there should be a preemptive ban which includes pakistan does it include india i don't know i have to check actually okay none of them are major military powers though okay and so it's not something that they're really thinking could be on their doorstep or something that they need because they are not there technologically right they're not there to the point where they can produce and deploy an autonomous weapon system. And you normally even see if when, they would want when to. countries have the weapon, they're like, no, I think it's fine. I think it's great. Actually. It's, it's a good yeah, thing yeah, to yeah, have. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Sorry, go ahead. But the, um, so in addition to cybersecurity, the, the ways in which autonomous weapon systems and particularly countries like Israel want to deploy them is anti-radar as like def- uh, defense systems. And I think that's where countries in the global south, especially those with abrasive neighbors, um, will be most likely to actually want to use and deploy this technology. Um, so you have that even, even in the sense of, so if you have something coming into your radar, just taking out immediately as a completely autonomous weapon system d- can do that. Um, and so, uh, so I actually think that countries like Pakistan, like India, um, they would be most likely to want that kind of technology we're not at the point yet where we can have that yeah. and it can be you know a proliferation like like we're talking about cheap drone, drones on amazon but they can't do what what you know states want them to yeah. do that's at the highest levels countries like china and russia being very secretive about what they're developing how they're developing it and it's um it is going to see, I think we are going to, we are already kind of seeing the start of a global AI arms race in that sense. Um, also because you can do, even as such as with cyber warfare, you can do it and be like, it ain't me. <laughs> so I think that lack of accountability kind of pushes the the ideas of, of get, you know, producing this technology. Um, so yeah, I think that you are going to see a global AI arms race, and I think you are going to see uh, the global South involved. And even even today, the the major producer of drones, uh, which you know sh- exports them to the rest of the world, is China. Yeah, and you know, I think it what what a lot of a lot of these conversations are happening when you're looking at autonomous weapons in isolation. Mm. What you don't realize is um, what we don't often realize is that what happens when they're used together in the in the theater of warfare. So, for example. Um, I think this was back in the 70s or 80s when uh, India and Israel, I think this is very well documented now, they were planning to take out Pakistan's nuclear facility. Mm. And then the issue, one of the issues they were facing was how do we refuel? And because Pakistan was very far away from Israel and then they said, okay, we might take off from India and then right, strike, right. hit our targets and then mm. run away with with drones or autonomous weapons flying. Yeah. And especially now when you think of technologies like hypersonic weapons. So, you know, it, it was in the news recently, China testing some missile that went around the globe and then hit its target. That's scary. Yeah, yeah. And then you have something like that taking off from, let's suppose, Israel or from India and striking another country's nuclear facility. 
But then the next question becomes, does the country that has been attacked, do they view that as a nuclear attack? Mm. Because, you know, you have, if you come in and and ha- strike my nuclear warheads, how do I retaliate then? Yeah. So yeah, that yeah. just completely complicates the whole, you know, this, um, the whole theater of warfare that how, how states perceive that is. Yeah. And, you know, with, with countries like Pakistan, we have a very, very ambiguous nuclear doctrine. We don't clarify what, uh, what our, what our red lines are mm. so how do you deal with states like that but you know oh oh, oh you know what we consider that as you crossing our red line so i yeah. i think it just complicates things even more yeah yeah i agree and i think that increasingly we're gonna see um warfare which operates on very multifaceted and which means that you know usually it would be like air land uh, water, we would see these three domains but it's increasingly gonna be we're also gonna attack you in <laughs> through cyberspace and through space. Yeah. So we're going to see the, an expansion to all five domains of warfare. Um, so yeah, this painting a very grim picture <laughs> of the future, yeah. but yes. Yeah, I, let, let's hope things uh, don't get out of hand yes. and uh, all the parties involved, they can you know, get together and make some sensible decisions. Uh, on that note, thank you so much for joining us, Aisha. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we hope you join us for future episodes as well. Thank you.